So uh, thank you, for, Crystal, for the nice introduction, and thank you to the organizers for allowing me to give this presentation in, in this uh, workshop. So this talk is going to be um, similar in spirit to some, some other ones that we've had uh, on Monday and Tuesday. And uh, uh, it's going to be about uh, modular reduction techniques. And I would like to mention before we start that this is joint work with uh, Fabio. Nobile. Now, um, the outline of my talk is going to be as follows. I will first introduce uh, in, a, in a purposefully um, vague way the class of problems that we're trying to, uh, to approximate. And then I will come back to that in a later moment. Uh, and uh, uh, then I will start to describe the method that uh, we worked on starting from the uh, low dimensional setting. So just one parameter, the frequency. Uh, and then we will move to the higher dimensional setting. And I will describe how we can extend the results from the low dimensional setting to the high dimensional one. Uh, then I will discuss some numerical experiments and then I will uh, conclude. So uh, the uh, prototypical example of problems that we're trying to consider is uh, frequency domain application like a frequency domain linear time invariant system that all of you have seen before. This comes from the Laplace or Fourier transform of a dynamical system. In this case, it's a linear time invariant uh, dynamical system. And you see that the structure is actually fairly simple. Um, we have the uh, scalar parameter, the scalar complex parameter Z that appears uh, in, the, in the state equation. X is the state of the system and Y is a collection of outputs. It doesn't need to be a scalar, it can be uh, a vector, but it's usually lower dimensional than the, than the state. And the, the question that we're trying to, um, to, to, to answer today is like, how can we get an approximation of the map that I will denote by U that maps the frequency Z to the quantity U of Z? Uh, and I'm using U to denote either the state X or the output uh, Y of the system, depending on the kind of application that we're considering. Now, just to, to give you an idea of where we started from when we um, asked ourselves this question, like we were considering some uh, PDE applications, um, the Helmholtz equation, for instance, uh, where the uh, parameter Z is the frequency squared that is obtained by um, Laplace or Fourier transform of the wave equation. And uh, uh, we can generalize it to more complicated examples by considering an infinite, dimension, infinite domain and we can obtain a so-called scattering problem, as we've seen also this morning. Um, and in this case, like this is a very simple uh, formulation, a very simplified version of a scattering problem where we truncate the domain and you see that we have, uh, we have yeah, the, this kind of condition on the, on the truncated boundary and it's a very simplified first order approximation of the Sommerfeld condition. So you can see that in this class of problems, actually we have the frequency appear in the boundary condition and also in the equation. So this is already not a linear time invariant system. But this is not going to matter for our technique. It's only going to matter for the theory that we've developed. Because in our technique, we're going to try to be uh, blind to the type of um, frequency dependence that we have in our problem. And uh, the example I'm showing here is the noise generated by an aircraft engine, uh, which we've considered in, a, in one of our papers. Now, um, just to show you what um, the solution to this kind of problems might look like over a certain range of frequencies, this is a made up example that I, I, I considered. Uh, you can see that as we vary the frequency of a range of uh, over a certain range, uh, if you look at the uh, magnitude of the, of the quantity we're approximating, uh, we might get something that looks a lot like this. So we have a bunch of peaks and this is just due to the specific form of the solution, which in this case can be obtained analytically. And you can imagine performing like a, for instance, a spectral decomposition of the matrix, of the matrix pencil Z E minus A. And then it turns out that actually the uh, form of the quantity U is going to be like this. So you see in particular that we have, uh, this is called a heavy side decomposition. And we have a bunch of residues R um, I divided by Z minus the pole, all the resonant frequency uh, lambda I. And if Z gets too close to one of the poles, then we get a, we get a peak, okay? And the, the, the solution can explode. And this is what we're trying to approximate here. Uh, and uh, the idea is that if, if we go back to this plot, actually, uh, you can think that every single point in this plot uh, is hiding behind it a, a computation, which is like the inversion of this matrix here. And if the problem is very big, inverting this matrix is expensive. And of course, you have to remember that every time you change Z, then this matrix is gonna change, okay? So you cannot, 
um, pre-compute an inverse that then you apply to a bunch of uh, right-hand sides, no, the, the matrix changes. And of course, we want to speed up the, um, the plotting of this kind of quantity because it's important in many applications. So what we do in model reduction is, um, well, this is the situation that we have. Uh, as time goes on, we want to evaluate the quantity U at several different values of the, of the frequency Z. Instead, what we do is we spend some time in a so-called offline phase by performing some sampling at uh, some well-chosen frequencies. And then we train a surrogate model. And then what we do in the online or deployment phase is that we use the surrogate model U tilde instead of the uh, high fidelity one. And if the surrogate model is much faster to evaluate than the original one, then we can hope to, to save time. Uh, of course, the, in, in practical applications, this is just uh, a very simplified example because in, in practice, we are also going to have, we're always going to have parameters on top of the frequency. So you can imagine that in a scattering problem, you might have geometric parameters like this morning, or in the case of a Helmholtz equation in a more general setting, we might have a parametrized um, uh, index of refraction. And in this case, you can imagine that the matrix is defined in the system and the force in term and the measurement matrix even can depend on parameters uh, theta that uh, I'm gonna assume uh, real, but potentially many, uh, and theta could be potentially large. So now the question is not anymore to, to just approximate U with respect to Z, but also with respect to theta, okay? And uh, just, just to give an idea of what this means in practice, like we, we have the same plot as before, but now as we vary theta, we're gonna get uh, changes in the frequency response of the system. So different colors will correspond to different thetas, which means that uh, by using the spectral uh, perspective, the residues and the um, poles of the system will depend on theta. Uh, this is just a diagram to, to, to repeat what I said until now. We have like two possibilities. Um, either we go, we, we feed the input Z and theta into the full model and we get out the solution and possibly a quantity of interest that we want to study. Or we can go through the reduced model, which is trained by taking samples of the high fidelity model and then we obtain a surrogate for the quantity of interest instead. And since uh, we're talking about UQ here, you can imagine like very easily a situation where the parameters theta are actually random variables. So the quantity of interest is itself a random variable. And let's say that we wanna um, apply a naive approach. We wanna just take Monte Carlo samples of the quantity of interest. We can do it in two ways. Either we follow the top path or the bottom path, okay? So in the top path, the, the total cost of the Monte Carlo simulation will be the number of Monte Carlo samples times the cost of the full model, which is inverting this expensive, uh, this high dimension, uh, this uh, big matrix. Or we can do, uh, we can apply the surrogate modeling approach where we spend some time training, some, some time and energy um, training the surrogate. So we take um, a number of training samples times the cost of the full model, but then the number of multi kernel samples is just multiplied by the cost of the reduced model instead. And uh, we would like to do all of this in the so-called non-intrusive paradigm, which all of you know already, but uh, just, just to uh, get everybody up to speed, like the idea is that we want to assume that uh, we, uh, so, well, we don't want to assume to be able to access the underlying system that uh, generates the data, so that gives us our samples. And in particular, we don't want to access the system blocks, okay, which is something that is necessary, for instance, in the reduced basis, in the, in the classical reduced basis approach. Uh, but of course, um, querying values of U is fine, but of course expensive, okay? So we want to we wanna get as few as possible. Uh, so from this point of view, the, what we're trying to do in model reduction is we take a bunch of, like, not too many, we take a few samples of frequency, parameter, and corresponding solution, and then we want to crunch the numbers, and then we want to get an approximation util. Of course, since we're trying to, to be as blind as possible to the structure of the problem, we need to make some assumptions on what we're trying to approximate, because okay, if we're trying to approximate a smooth quantity, then we're going to apply different methods with respect to the ones that I'm going to describe now. Um, Okay, so I will start from the simplest case, the case where the parameters are actually not there, okay? We are just trying to understand how the quantity U depends on frequency. And it's gonna, like the, this assumption that I'm making at the end here is gonna come up immediately because the way that we decide to approximate this quantity is by remembering that, look, we know uh, in, in, from, in the spectral, from the spectral viewpoint, how this quantity U depends on Z we know that it depends on Z in a rational way, so we're gonna use rational approximation to, to uh, build a surrogate for the quantity U. 
And then this talk, I will uh, focus on the barycentric coordinate representation of rational uh, approximation or rational functions, which if you've never seen it, it's just a very convenient way to represent rational functions in a numerically stable way. Because for instance, we have uh, a possibility to evaluate stable in a stable way the rational function in linear time. And uh, in many cases, it's also stable to compute the roots of this polynomial. But the, 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 the property that we're um, mostly relying on in, in our construction is that it's trivial to achieve interpolation um, of this rational function. So essentially, if you choose just the coefficients on top here in a certain way, okay, you just assign by hand the values of the coefficients on top, then you automatically can achieve interpolation at uh, the so-called support points, which are these Z, J points. And this is very nice because we don't have to invert van der Waals matrices and we don't have to worry about conditioning of interpolation problems. Now, of course, applying rational approximation to um, the uh, model reduction of frequency response problems is not a new idea. I, I put here only a few references. There's many more. Uh, and I put some names of some methods here in the title of this slide. Uh, I will call this approaches standard uh, rational approximation because they're both uh, um, characterized by a certain limitation that I will get to in a minute. The, the way these approaches work, I, I put here just a skeleton of the algorithm. Essentially, we start by taking samples of the quantity that we're trying to approximate. Uh, then we set up a least squares rational approximation problem, which is like the, the way you would do it with polynomials, right? Except you just notice that the uh, denominator Q that you're trying to find appears in a nonlinear and non-convex way in this quantity that you're trying to minimize. So what's common is one linearizes this problem in this way. So basically you multiply everywhere by Q and then you solve this problem instead, which can be done by SVD. It's, it's, a, it's a very simple quadratic problem that can be solved very easily. Now, uh, the, the limitation I was, uh, I was hinting at before is actually that if you just look at this kind of problem that we're trying to solve and you look at the number of um, uh, unknowns in your approximation, so the number of coefficients of P and Q, um, and you compare it with the number of uh, samples that you've taken, then what you have is that you need to take at least as many samples as twice the degree of the denominator. Because like, if you're trying to solve this problem, you're trying to find Q and P at the same time. Okay? And this, like, when I, when I first saw this, I, I thought, I mean, what a waste, right? So we, we're, we're taking twice the samples to approximate something with a degree which is only half the samples that we take. And that's what motivated us to, to, to go further, so to, 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 to improve on this uh, kind of approaches, and we came up with the minimal Russian interpolation method. Uh, minimal, in this case, refers to the fact that actually we save um, samples from before. So essentially the idea is if we fix a certain uh, approximation degree, then with minimal Russian interpolation, we can get away with half the samples, or vice versa, for a certain number of samples, we can get away with twice the approximation degree, so we can uh, hope for a better accuracy. And the, the, the way that we achieve this is actually by, by exploiting the property that I discussed before. So here we are finding P and Q at the same time. Instead, let's find first Q and then P at a second moment, okay? So in this way, we can save that half information that got wasted before. And the, the way we find Q is actually very simple. We just uh, solve a very simple minimization problem, which is completely unjustified, okay? Just, just, just take it as it is, okay? We solve this minimization problem, which essentially uh, corresponds to uh, finding a linear combination of our snapshots here, U, Z, J, uh, and uh, uh, minimizing the norm of the, of the linear combination. And here, this is what uh, is linked to what Fabio hinted at yesterday in the, in the discussion session, that here, uh, you can imagine that if u is a scalar quantity, then this problem is kind of stupid because there's infinitely many ways to obtain zero here. I'm just taking a linear combination of scalar quantities. So, I mean, it's easy to get zero. But if u is high dimensional, then this problem becomes interesting, okay? Uh, and uh, the nice thing here from a practical viewpoint is that it's actually very easy to solve this problem. It's just, it's just a few linear algebra operations on SVD and then we're done. And then, as I said before, like we just define the numerator P by imposing some interpolation conditions, and that's it, okay? So it's, it's, a, it's a very simple algorithm that seems to, to um, uh, improve on standard technique. Now, uh, the, 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 the quantity that we minimize to obtain the denominator Q seems kind of arbitrary, and the historical reason for choosing that is a bit involved, so I will not go into the details, but the, 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 the upshot is that we can develop a theory that tells us that basically, I'm not gonna go into the details here either, but uh, tells us that this functional gives us a good denominator for the purposes of approximation. 
I can go back to the, to the theory if, uh, if you want. This is just to, to show you from a numerical viewpoint, like what I just told you. Here, we're comparing three different methods for model reduction of a very simple uh, made up example. Uh, when we increase the number of samples, the number of snapshots that we take, and we fix them uh, as the roots of unity for simplicity. So every single S will correspond to the uh, S order roots of unity. And we're looking at the approximation, order, uh, approximation error at a certain point. So we're comparing um, the uh, POD approach. So this is a projective approach that is intrusive. So we cannot apply it in the kind of setting that we're at because we are assuming in POD to be able to access the blocks of the system, but we take it as a benchmark, okay? Then we compare it with the Levner framework, which is a, a standard rational approximation approach and with our technique, minimal Russian interpolation. And the, the, as you can see here, like uh, you, you can see that the minimal Russian interpolation and POD seem to converge at the same rate. And actually uh, minimal Russian interpolation beats by a small margin POD for a given amount of information. But the Levner framework converges much more slowly. And this is due to this uh, half the samples that get wasted in, uh, in setting up the optimization problem uh, issue. But this is not the end of the, of the story because we can actually do better. Uh, just like POD can be improved to get the, the weak greedy uh, reduced basis algorithm, as we've seen in several talks already, we can actually develop a weak greedy version of minimal Russian interpolation that achieves a better, uh, not the better convergence rate in this case, but a better error. Error. Also, because remember that we're just looking at a, at a single point to estimate the error, which is not a, a great indicator. Um, and you see that actually we can achieve with the greedy a minimal Russian interpolation a similar rate as the greedy reduced basis approach. And one of the key features of this greedy minimal Russian interpolation approach is that we can do it non intrusively, which might be surprising, but uh, it's something that we managed to do for the class of problems that we're uh, trying to approximate. Uh, this is a, another benchmark just to show you that even in more complicated settings, not just a, a made up example, our method performs well. And this is a benchmark from, uh, um, uh, from uh, structural analysis of one module of the International Space Station. And you can see that here the range of frequencies spans over different orders of magnitude, but we can still uh, perform a rational approximation due to the beneficial uh, numerical properties of the barycentric basis. Okay, so if here we had been using a polynomial representation for the numerator and a polynomial representation for the polynomial basis for the numerator and a polynomial basis for the denominator, we wouldn't be able to do this because like, the orders of magnitude are just too wide, too large. But we can see that the results that we obtain are very similar if we compare it with the reduced basis benchmark, but we can actually train the model in a, in a much faster time for for funny reasons that I guess we can, we can go back to. But the two methods are not equivalent, okay? We get different results and the two greedy algorithms actually sample at, at different points. They, they have a different history, sampling history. All right, so this was the, like a, a summary of the picture in the one dimensional case. So where we just had the frequency as a parameter that we were studying. So let, let's see what happens if we add more parameters. And this is like the, the simplest difficult problem that, that you can come up with. So this is the Helmholtz equation over a parametric domain. So we're just trying to study the vibration modes of this uh, membrane, this rectangular membrane. And uh, we have this uh, slit or fracture, I don't know, depends if it's a, if it's a design feature or a bug, I guess. Uh, and the, the length of this, uh, of this crack is parameterized by the, the scalar parameter theta. And uh, the, the, the point here, as I was saying before, is that if we, um, if we uh, vary the frequency and the parameter at the same time, this is a contour plot of the norm of the solution of the Helmholtz equation, uh, you see that there are these bright lines and these bright lines are the resonances of the problem. As we vary the parameter, then these resonance lines just move around a bit and dance and intersect and do a bunch of crazy stuff. So you can, you can see that the problem is much more complicated than before. So we know that there are these uh, four resonances in this uh, range of frequencies, but I mean, who knows what happens as we vary theta? So how can we model this, this kind of behavior as theta changes, especially in a non-intrusive framework? Yeah, theta is the length of this. Uh, oh. this uh, so it's, it's uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions, conditions everywhere. Uh, here we have boundary conditions, and of course, as theta changes, you can imagine that the eigenvalues of the Laplacian change, and that that's, that's what make this problem complicated because eigenproblems are tricky. Essentially, parametric eigenproblems are trickier than normal eigenproblems. Right. So uh, how do we approximate this uh, this guy? Okay. So the, the, the naive idea, of course, is to generalize the rational approximation uh, technique to the high dimensional, to the higher dimensional setting. So 
So for instance, we might look for an approximation that looks like this. So with respect to Z, we still have the barycentric basis, but then we also add some uh, theta dependence in the numerators. And this is, uh, we cannot use barycentric coordinates also in theta because unfortunately barycentric coordinates don't exist for um, higher than one dimension. Uh, but the problem is that if you uh, like the, 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 we try to do this and we encountered so many problems essentially related to the course of dimension because it turns out that um, uh, first of all if you if you don't use some sparsity in the indices of the polynomials uh, theta then I mean you run out of memory very quickly but on a different note like it's not even guaranteed that very few indices are going to be enough to give you a good representation of your problem okay there are some very simple problems that I, that we could come up with that actually have a, a they require a very large set here to represent accurately the solution so instead what we decided to do is uh, something slightly different so we decided to build upon a separate field of model reduction uh, parametric model reduction for dynamical systems uh, that's called parametric model reduction. It's not exactly a solution, but it's uh, it's an improvement over what a um, high dimensional version of the of the uh, rational approximation um, could give. And parametric model reduction is just a synonym for uh, marginalization of the frequency. And instead of um, uh, spending too many words on this, I'm going to use this picture to explain what's going on. So this picture is, is the same picture as before, except I'm just taking some slices some sections, uh, some fibers, I should call them, some fibers at different values of, um, of uh, theta. And I'm plotting with different colors uh, the response at the fixed values of theta. And of course, like if you think about it, each single line uh, is the response of a non-parametric system because we fixed theta to obtain each of them. So the only thing that's left is actually to, to, to be able to tell what happens in between the two different colors, right? And this is what parametric model reduction is about. So we, we, we fix the, pro the parameters theta and then we apply the one dimensional um, method, and then we try to, to bridge the gaps between different models that we obtain. Now, just to give you an idea of how we can bridge this gap, I'm gonna make like a small cartoon, I guess. So imagine that these are two of the fibers that we're trying to, to link up one to the other, at two different values of the parameter. This is uh, theta one and this is theta two. And let's assume that uh, we're asking ourselves the question, like what's the uh, response, what's the, what's the function u gonna look like at the average of the two parameters? And of course, the, the obvious answer is, well, take the average, right? Uh, but if you take the average, then something goes very wrong, because if you take the average of infinity with any number, you get infinity. So essentially, uh, you had three uh, peaks here and three peaks here, and you get six peaks in the, in the average, which, of course, is not gonna happen, what happens in practice, because in practice, we know that actually the peaks don't increase in number. They just move around they, of, the, of the frequency range, but they don't like, just, just multiply by two uh, out of a sudden, right? So this is not actually what, um, what we're supposed to do. Instead, what we decided to do is to look at the spectral perspective, just like at the beginning. And uh, instead of taking the average of the responses themselves, instead of taking the average of the U's themselves, we take the average of the residues and the poles that we get from a barycentric, from a um, heavy side decomposition of the surrogates. So here we're not looking at quantities that correspond to the original system, but we trust the rational surrogates enough that we can replace them with the surrogate ones. So these are the poles and the residues that we get from the rational surrogate that we have computed. And there is a stable way to compute residues and poles from a rational function in barycentric coordinates. And as you see here, we are taking the average, as I said, of residues and poles. And what we get is something more sensible. So we, the, the poles don't magically multiply, but they just move around as they should. And of course, here I'm, I'm hiding something under the carpet kind of, uh, in the sense that if we are taking the average of, uh, of uh, R, Rin, R1n, and R2n, then I need to decide in which way I order, <laughs> I order the poles, right? Because like commutativity is a, is a thing. So uh, what we do, what we need to do actually is we need to, to kind of match the, the peaks on one side with the peaks on the other. And in particular, you can remember from the plot that I showed you before that sometimes actually the peaks decide to, to just cross each other because they want to. <laughs> the, it's, it's something that can happen even without, even in, in very regular settings. So we need to be able to identify when uh, this matching should actually cross itself. So the, 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 these arrows, let's say, should cross themselves. And the way we perform this matching is actually very simple. So we, we, we uh, build this graph that contains the spectral information of the two surrogates. So the ones on top is the surrogate uh, at theta one. And you see here that I am, I'm using an, a node for the first pole residue, the, a node for the second pole residue, and a node for the third one, and then same one for the second surrogate. 
So this one, the blue, this one, this was the blue curve and the one below is the red curve. Then I link up all the nodes above with all the nodes below. And I assign a weight that somehow tells me how far apart the pole above and the pole below are and the corresponding residues to. Okay? And what I do is I just find a matching uh, of the nodes on top and the nodes below that minimizes this total cost. Okay? So at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, minimizing like this, this weighted um, different distance between the poles and between the residues. And this can be done in polynomial time because some computer scientist has done it before me. Okay? And I can, I can build upon what, what they, they've done in the, in the 70s, I think. All right. So all of this is, is well and done. So it's good and done. So we, we've done the matching. So we were able to, to sort the spectral information in a way that is consistent between different circuits. But now, how do we um, predict, given a certain amount of information, what the response is going to be at the, new, uh, at the new theta point? Let's imagine that you've used your favorite Ampli method, you can use quasi Monte Carlo, you can use whatever, uh, to, 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 to drop some points over a theta space. Okay, this um, is just a two dimensional um, graphical depiction. And uh, what I've done is I've sorted the pole residue information in such a way that it's consistent, as I said, using the algorithm that I showed you in the previous slide. Now, what, what should I predict for the new point theta star? This is a, non, a point where I don't have an, an observation. Okay. What am I going to predict at that point? And the idea is that I, I, don't, I do exactly as I told you before. So we just take a combination of the residues and a combination of the poles, and we plug them into this uh, heavy side decomposition. And of course, now we, we don't take averages anymore. We, in general, we take a, a weighted combination of the spectral quantities. And of course, if the samples are distributed in a, in a non-structured way, you can use whatever you want. You can use kernel based or radial basis. You can use polynomials. You can use nearest neighbor, you can use Gaussian process regression, you can use whatever. Yes, Lorenzo. Uh, from the previous slide, the one with, this, with the slices, it appears like this is a method that works for 1D theta only, right? Mm -hmm. But now your theta is multidimensional. So uh, am I missing something or you haven't told us how you move from one parameter to many parameters? Uh, this works exactly the same way if uh, the thetas are actually high dimension, because this just assumes that we're matching two models, right? Okay. Uh, then uh, this is actually what I'm explaining, explaining in this slide, like how you actually do this at the forward average in the higher dimensional setting. Oh. And th basically, this uh, this uh, weights phi i are just uh, the weights you would use for uh, the approximation of a smooth function. From sparse data. So let's even, just forget that here we're talking about rational functions, just forget that we're talking about poles and residues. Mm -hmm. Let's say that you have a function that depends on theta and you're given its values at those points. Mm -hmm. How do we predict the value of the new point? Well, we just take a combination of the values that we have, you, we solve a, 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 a coefficient approach, you can use any squares, you can use whatever. And these are just ways that belong to some class that you can fix in advance as a user. Uh, and usually, like if the if data is, is non structured, I choose radial basis because I like it. You, you can choose basically whatever you want. Okay, 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 thank you. But, um, yeah. but of course, like if you have more structured data, if you have data on a source grid, you can do a bit better. You can use a more structured way to perform this kind of uh, interpolation or extrapolation. Okay, you can use wavelets, you can use something more, more advanced, as we've seen in several talks already. Now, all of this is nice and good, but um, since we are assuming to be non-intrusive, um, it's kind of uh, cheating to know in advance how many samples, how many, how many uh, pins we have to drop in the parameter. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, Virginia? So about uh, one or two slides before. Uh, how You may have said it, and I may have missed it, but how do you choose the, choose the respective weights W lambda and W point? Um, but it's, it's up to the user, and uh, it depends a lot on the application. Usually, um, it depends on how large you expect the residues to be. <laughs> uh, so, in my implementation, I think I remap the uh, frequency domain to be minus one one. So basically, that normalizes the poles. But then you have to choose how large your residues are going to be, and it depends. Uh, like if, if you have a PDE, for instance, you can estimate the um, the norm of the residues from the norm of the right hand side. Because they're related since uh, yeah, spectral, uh, uh, spectral decomposition, essentially. It's, uh, you, you have to basically have some information on how large your sector, your residues are uh, J to be. Uh, there, there's no clear recipe for doing it. 
what you mentioned as well, but the slide previous to this, how do you know, if, uh, how do you know if there's not a fourth peak? Um, I can offer that after the end of the presentation. Of the presentation. It's, a, it's an open question that we have here. Uh, so, um, as I said, as I was saying, like we, we don't know in advance how many samples we want to take, so we want to incorporate some kind of uh, adaptive sampling in our in our method. And uh, the way we do this uh, is through uh, so-called locally adaptive uh, sparse grids. And uh, this is just an algorithm for reference, but uh, I, I would prefer to show you how it works with this uh, with this diagram on the on the right. So let's assume that uh, we have like a two-dimensional uh, parameter domain, uh, theta one and theta two. On top of the frequency, remember the frequency is always uh, like an extra axis that we are marginalizing. Uh, so let's assume that we've taken these five um, sample points over uh, theta space, and we have some spectral information at each of those five points. And we want to ask the question: Is the current surrogate model good enough or not? So we we, we use like the sparse grid structure to our advantage to define a, a test set, which are the red points, and I mean. You can see that actually the red points are just the, the points of the margin of the current sparse grid, but it's going to change very soon, so don't, don't get too attached to them. The, the, the idea is that we define these uh, red points as a neighborhood of the current uh, training points. Then what we do is we perform an expensive evaluation at each of the red points because we want to be able to tell if, for instance, at this red point, the surrogate is, is accurate enough. And since we are in an intrusive setting, we don't have an estimator in general. Um, to tell us whether that point is going to be well approximated or not. And it's one of the main limitations of the non-intrusive approach like this one, because we're not assuming anything on the dependence on theta of our problem. Let's say that we see uh, this point and this point are exceeding the tolerance okay, that the user sets. So we just add them to the training set. Okay? And then we are fine the test set. And you can see here that we're not using one of the standard multi-indices approaches, like adaptive uh, sparse grid using multi-indices, because we are adding single points and not whole levels of the, of the sparse grid. And then we go on like this, we identify the points that are badly approximated, and we proceed like this, and we achieve localized adaptivity uh, by um, relying on the underlying uh, uh, sparse grid structure. And this doesn't break um, the structure that we need for doing interpolation using, for instance, wavelets, but that might not, uh, that requires a bit of, uh, of care. And of course, all the red points, remember, are associated to a very expensive computation, exactly because we don't have this, um, we don't have the luxury of having a, an a posteriori estimator to tell us whether we want to add, we need to add a point or not. Right. So I would like to show you some numerical examples to show that this, um, this actually works in practice. Uh, the first one is um, is, a, is a toy example, literally. It's the uh, vibrations of a tuning fork. Uh, so we have the frequency here as a parameter, uh, but we also have uh, material parameters. So the density, the Poisson's ratio, uh, uh, and the Young's modulus of the of the tuning fork are parameters that I model as random variables, are uniform random variables for simplicity. And I'm interested in two um, uh, quantities of interest that are nonlinear. The first one is the maximum displacement of the tuning fork. And the second one is the natural frequency of the tuning fork, so the sound that you get if you use the tuning fork, which is basically the, the um, uh, smallest, like, smallest eigenvalue of um, this problem if you treat Z as the eigenvalue. And yeah, the, the, I should say that we are using an elastic uh, Helmholtz type equation to model this kind of problem, and we're using finite elements for the discretization. And we, we run our uh, adaptive algorithm for sampling over theta space and our adaptive algorithm for sampling uh, over Z space as well, over a frequency space. And this, for instance, is what we get if we look at statistics of the frequency response of the system. So here we have like, uh, we are able to identify the, the average response of the system and also the standard deviation at some points by just uh, querying our uh, surrogate model. But if you look at the two quantities of interest that I talked about, so this is the maximum displacement and this is the natural frequency, then we can actually uh, do, as I said at the beginning, we can use our surrogate model to, to, um, to produce some surrogate Monte Carlo samples of the, of the solution. And then we, we throw them into a kernel density estimator to obtain an approximation of the density of the two quantities of interest. And here for quantitative uh, comparison, I'm just putting some approximation errors in the moments of the, in the first few moments of the, of the, of the quantities of interest. Uh, and uh, uh, these timings that you see here 
are obtained by comparing um, the surrogate model and the high fidelity model, and not just in terms of how um, quickly I can evaluate the surrogate model, but also including the training phase, okay? Also including the expensive offline phase, because if the offline phase takes <laughs> takes longer than the sampling, the Monte Carlo samplings of, of the Monte Carlo sampling of the high fidelity model, then I mean, what's the point? And um, uh, we can achieve some very significant speed ups, even including this. A second example is a, is a higher dimensional example. So the one before uh, was three dimensional. So we had three stochastic parameters and uh, the frequency. Here we have, this is an example from uh, electrical engineering and, and we have nine stochastic parameters plus the frequency. And uh, I'm showing here the results of the, of, the, of the offline phase where we used our adaptive algorithm. And uh, you can see that if we uh, train our model based on around 700 um, uh, samples of theta, our uh, set of testing points, so if you remember the, 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 the red dots in my slide from before, is actually around 8,000, 8, okay? And this is a problem because, of course, as we uh, refine more and more our training set, the testing set will contain all the neighbors, and of course, this is going to get larger and larger with the dimension with the, uh, as the number of, the, of parameters increases. And this is a problem that cannot be easily solved, and I don't think there is uh, there is a, a straightforward way to do adaptivity without an error estimator in high dimensions without having to pay this price. Uh, yes, so this is just for a, for a comparison of the surrogate that we get with our model, and we see that actually the 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 parameter variations are actually pretty large. You see that we have the, the phenomena that I showed you before. We have poles crossing. The poles in this case are red. Um, and uh, uh, I would like just to, to say something about the, the adaptive procedure in this, in this case. Uh, so of course, I cannot show you the sample points because they're nine dimensional, but I can show you some, uh, some projections onto uh, some lower dimensional um, sets of parameters. And you can see here that we can draw some conclusions like, okay, it doesn't seem like the values of the resistors affect in any way the, the response. But, and of course, this means that we can uh, draw some sensitivity conclusions based even just only on the sampling um, points that we get with our adaptive algorithm. And of course, the, the second question, which is, uh, I think, kind of an obvious question, like we are using a training test uh, training set and a test set to, to perform our adaptivity. So we know that when our algorithm converges, reaches convergence, then we know that the tolerance is going to be obtained over the test set, right? But what happens over the rest of theta, right? Over the rest of the, um, of the parameter space, because we are kind of looking only at the test set to draw conclusions about the approximation of the whole space. So what we did as a kind of a validation, um, validation computation, we, we just drew 500 random samples and then we try to look at the error at those uh, 500 random samples. And you can see that 85% uh, of them actually are below the tolerance and 15% of them are above the tolerance. So one is like a relative measure of how, um, it's like the eff effectivity of the estimator, if you want. Um, uh, but even if they are above the tolerance, which we should have expected because it's a nine dimensional space and we're using very few uh, samples, they never get too large, okay? They're like it, at most, they, they, we are underestimating the error by a factor of two in this case. So it seems like we're not doing too bad. And due to the dimensionality of the problem, I, I just don't think we can do any better than this without wasting a bunch of resources. Right, so um, the summary of uh, what I presented is this. So I started from the uh, very simple, the simpler case of approximating the frequency response of a non-parametric system. And I've um, tried to explain how minimal Russian interpolation can give you a, um, in a quasi-optimal way, an approximation um, starting from samples of the solution without any knowledge of the underlying system. Uh, we can perform some greedy uh, sampling, um, which can be actually certified for a certain class of problems, which are the linear time invariant systems that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and uh, of course, we can generalize it to a broader class of problems, as I was hinting before, as long as we can approximate well uh, uh, the, the function u by a rational function, and as long as certain spectral conditions are satisfied, and I will go into that. In a, in a second, then we can also apply minimal Russian interpolation without the need to, to have a, a um, linear time invariant system underneath, a, a frequency domain linear time invariant system underneath. And the, the technical condition that we need, the technical spectral condition that we need, is that if you remember heavy side decomposition, we want the residues, the, the R values on top, to be linearly independent. As long as the, uh, the R values are linearly independent, we can hope our approximation to work well. 
uh, in the parametric case, like I, I've, I've told you essentially what the main issues are in uh, generalizing the one dimensional case to the higher dimensional setting. Uh, but instead what, instead what we choose to do is we use this matching and combining approach, uh, exploiting a spectral decomposition of the rational surrogates that we compute using minimal rational interpolation. And uh, the adaptive sampling that I discussed is kind of, in some sense, the best we could do. But if you don't like this kind of um, very uh, quickly uh, increasing size of the test set, you can just skip the adaptivity step and you can just draw the values of theta that you sample from using quasi Monte Carlo, for instance. Nothing prevents you from doing that, except if you, if you, if you don't have this sparse grid structure, then you have to rely on some other strategy for interpolating uh, over the parameter domain, like radial basis or Gaussian process regression, or even a, a very simple nearest neighbor approach, if you want. Some, some open questions that, uh, that remain at this point. Uh, we don't have that many questions on the non-parametric setting, so I, I'm, I didn't put any here. Um, in, in terms of our approach, the, there's a question that, uh, that <laughs> came up before. So essentially, what happens if the surrogates that we're trying to balance, uh, we're trying to match, are unbalanced, okay? So what happens if um, like one model has three poles and the other one has 10, okay? So how do we perform the matching? How do we perform the, the combination? And we have some ways to deal with this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to this in a second, uh, but they're all heuristic, okay? Essentially, we give a score to the poles that are missing, and essentially, we have to decide whether they're missing because the surrogate is too bad or because um, they shouldn't be in the richer model, okay? So essentially, either the model with 10 poles has seven extra ones that we can throw away, or the model with three poles is too bad and we have to retrain it somehow. And there are some in intermediate cases, uh, but all of this, as I said, it's, it's a bit technical, a bit more on the implementation side and all heuristics so far. Um, and then, yes, th there's another issue that I haven't discussed really, which is like, even if the problem depends on theta in a very smooth way, it is possible for the poles and the residues to, to not be smooth at all, okay? You can imagine having a bifurcation in the, um, in the poles and that can happen even, if a, even with a very smooth uh, theta dependence. How do we do that? Well, our method works, but in general, the approximation quality will be bad because we're using sparse grids to approximate something that's not, that, that's C0, but not even C1. We can expect a much slower convergence. Now, in terms of alternative to, to the, method, the, the method we propose, like I, I try to explain why the joint approach where we just throw frequency and parameters together and we use uh, a rational approximation method as not the, might, might not be the best idea. Uh, so we can try to use some sparse um, rational approximation so that we don't um, run head first into the course of dimension, but it's not really clear if the class is rich enough. And even if you use a sparse approximation, it's not even guaranteed that you, you, can, uh, you, can, uh, you can do this in a, in a numerically efficient way. It might be a bit too expensive. Just because of the sheer number of samples that you need, especially in high dimensions. Uh, there are, however, however, other approaches in, uh, in uh, parametric model reduction. So what we did was to take um, um, combinations, so, so, so to interpolate the spectral properties, so the residues and the poles, but instead you can imagine like taking the average or the combinations of the numerator P and the denominator Q. But of course, this is not necessarily stable because you can imagine that if you have a denominator of degree five and another denominator of degree five, a combination of the two might have degree one. Okay, so you have to be careful uh, about what happens to the poles that you're missing in that case. And instead something that could make more sense is to take an, um, a manifold interpolation of the rational surrogates, but it's not really clear to me at least uh, how this can be done in effic efficient efficiently uh, especially if the space over which we are interpolating is high dimensional. I'm not sure this can be uh, online efficient um, without sacrificing some kind of accuracy. And, uh, and then of course the other question is like, um, poor residue interpolation like we do is a specific kind of manifold approximation. Um, is a more general setting necessarily gonna be better than this? And uh, we don't know the, the answers to this yet. So yeah, thank you all for your attention and that's it.